This week on Inside My Canoe, we have the pleasure of talking to George Siegel, the director of Last House Standing. A fantastic interview. Sit back and enjoy the conversation. Well, thanks, George, for joining us on uh, Inside My Canoe Head, and I appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk with us about your film. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Now, I had the opportunity to watch the film, and it's uh, it's right up my alley. And I just wanted to give you uh, a chance to to tell us a bit about how you came to doing this particular film on this particular subject. You know, it all ties in so much to where I grew up and what I ended up doing for a living when I had my first career before I started making films. You know, I grew up in Southern California from age 12 on, and we always had to deal with Santa Ana winds and wildfires, and that's one of the things we featured in the film. And our house actually caught on fire in one of them. Uh, the fire department actually came and was able to put it out really quickly, but our whole house could have burned down. Um, and it was a yearly concern for us. The, the other elements in the film came from being in the television news business. I was a TV weatherman for 14 years, and I was also an anchor and a feature reporter, and I'd always cover stories where people would get wiped out by disasters. And I'd always watch the news where every year you hear the same story. You know, people living along the Mississippi, their house gets wiped out by flooding and they go, we're going to rebuild. Or the people in a hurricane zone that their houses and their community gets destroyed. And they said, we're hardy people, we're going to rebuild. And I go, wow, no matter where you do this, it's the same tragedy, just different locations. Why does this keep happening? We see it's a problem. Insurance never is easy to deal with after the problem. So why do we keep beating our head against the walls and making the same mistakes? And I said, well, let me make a film about this. And I can't make lawmakers and politicians and all those people do anything. I think they're all out for themselves and they really don't care about us. So we have to be our own best advocates. We have to understand our risks and we have to do something about it to make ourselves safer. And that's the whole point of the film is you're responsible for covering your own ass. And if you don't, who are you going to blame? You know, you just go into a, a, a tailspin. Your whole life is upended in a disaster. So why not do everything you can to avoid it? And, and the, the most, I always say on this, uh, on this podcast and in all of our works, that the most important question in emergency preparedness is who is responsible for your outcomes? And the answer needs to be you. Um, because like you said, so many other forces, so many other stakeholders, players in the disaster response and recovery phases, um, are very much self-interested. Uh, the insurance companies is, is not going to do you a solid, you know, just give you some money on the side, just cause you're in hard times. Uh, they're in it to make money and the reinsurers that insure them are in it to make sure that they don't lose money. So it's in the end, unfortunately, the truism that underlines all of this is exactly that, that people on their own are responsible to take the necessary steps. And so how much of a role do you see uh, your film in helping to advocate not only for that, but advocating for people to be their own best advocates towards making some code zoning type changes? Well, the challenge is getting people to see the film. You know, that's always the biggest challenge. When I've showed it to people in the emergency preparedness business, you know, flood people, disaster people, they love it. It speaks their language. It's what they are passionate about. And those are the people that are truly the heroes in every story. The first responders, the people that that save people's lives and help them get back on the road to recovery. Uh, so I would hope, you know, it's just a challenge of getting it out there. We know we've had the film on on public television here in the United States. They don't have a huge audience. It's hard to to really um, to measure that. If they're not behind it and you don't have a lot of money, it's hard to get the word out that it's on yeah. there. So we're on Tubi TV, T-U-B-I TV, where people can watch the movie for free. And it's also on my website where, where you watched it. And the idea is just how do you get people to see it? You know, the movie came out during COVID. So we were in 16 film festivals that we actually got a, a, some type of award in. But we didn't get to go to the festivals and meet people on the ground and shake hands and pitch the film because of COVID. So we lost out on that opportunity. So now the film's online. Um, I try to make it available. Uh, it, I do online screenings. Um, if I go speak somewhere, I try to make the film available to people that are part of the conference for training. It's in libraries. 
And the idea is to get people to see it so you wake up. Because, you know, you mentioned insurance companies. It's tough. when If you have a house, your last line of defense, your protection is an insurance company. And their goal is not to pay you. And they may tell you differently. But if you don't do everything perfectly, you're not getting your money. So yeah. we have this false sense of, well, I'll just get my money and rebuild. I know people that have fought with insurance companies for years to get their money. And I'm not saying as a business, they're, you know, I'm not criticizing them for how they run their business because they have to stay in business, but they're not our ally. They're not our friend. They're, they're somebody that, that says, yeah, if we have to pay you, we will. But if we don't, we won't. It's like health insurance. You know, maybe yep. it's a little different up in Canada, but here in the United States, it's a battle sometimes to get your health insurance paid. They don't want to pay you. And if they don't have to, they won't. Right. It, it, it's the same as some people run into um, HR at work. Human resources is there to protect the firm. It's not there to help you navigate problems that are going on in the workplace. It's there to do that perspective. And insurance is is just that. It's it's people's easy button risk transfer. But I've said it in a blog this week, and I've said it on previous podcasts. How many people actually read their insurance policy? I mean, well, I'll be nobody. frank. I just went through a rev my annual review of my insurance because I've got the notification for my house, house insurance. Uh, I realized I don't have earthquake coverage. And and I live in an earthquake fault zone. Now, we we haven't had any in the last, you know, probably seven decades that have caused structural damage to homes. But I remember hanging on, shake, rattling, and rolling in my home here in Ottawa some dozen years ago. I... I didn't know I didn't have insurance. And then when I tried to add it to it, I found that it was going to be near $500 on top of my premium, which would be a 35% increase in my household premium. And I'm like, okay, maybe I won't do that. But that's part of the conversation is maybe I'm not willing to spend $500, but I could lose a half a million dollar asset because I'm not willing to spend $500. Yeah, I think you're thinking about it wrong and i think everybody thinks about it wrong and they look at insurance as a burden i know people that have the highest deductible on their health insurance because they figure they're healthy well nobody plans on getting cancer nobody plans on having an accident where all of a sudden you need it you don't plan on your house burning down you don't plan on a, a tornado wiping out your house or an earthquake but the reality is in certain situations getting those extra coverages is a lot less expensive than you think so for example flood insurance we talked about this in the film, and, and, and the reality is people in, in Houston, in Hurricane Harvey, that were flooded and had the most damage, did not live in a flood zone. So they could have purchased flood insurance for $350, $400, yeah. and, and they would have been covered. That, that would have been the difference between them getting their lives back on some type of track versus losing everything. So there's certain situations where you need to think about that. Reading your policy, absolutely, and have someone explain it to you, and make sure you have an, an insurance agent that read it also, and that they understand it. Because you don't know that you might not be covered if that's a named storm in a hurricane. You don't know what your deductible is. You don't know what little exclusions there are for certain things. And people need to understand that. And the reason they don't, it's a burden. It's like, well, I have it, so I'm not gonna need it, but I just wanna have it. And then you have a good year and you go, I don't need it next year. They say that it's a El Nino year, so we may not have bad hurricanes. It only takes one. And your house is such a mainstay in your existence of your, what your investment is. That may be where you have to throw thousands of dollars at protecting it because that's the cost of having that. And if you don't think that way, then you can't cry when you lose it because you're kind of putting yourself out there as a target and saying, I'm not going to worry about this. I'm going to go to the beach today. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do something else. And then when an accident happens or something tragic happens, a big storm, you look around going, how'd this happen to me? Why, why didn't anybody look out for me? Because you didn't yeah. look out for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like referencing earlier, our conversation about uh, wildfires in my home province in Nova Scotia, that a number of homes are burnt down, but they happen to be constructed in the middle of the wild land urban interface. Um, individuals are not creating a defensible area around their home to fight the wildfires. And they're living in blissfully unaware of the threat they have and their insurance policies cover fire, but not necessarily all fire. 
and not necessarily certain types of fire. And so now some people are having that instance of where they're now in that struggle that you speak of with the insurance company to say, okay, if it was a wildfire caused by nature, is that a different calamity than a wildfire caused by man, by Absolutely. a company? And it's assigning yeah. that blame. And they've had this, this in California where they try to source how the fire started because that can make a major difference in whether or not you get paid. But if you live out around trees, how can you not assume that a fire is possible? Yeah. I live in Tampa, Florida, where we don't have a, a ton of trees close to the house, but we have uh, power lines in the backyard and we have a couple of palm trees back there. And last year during Hurricane Ian, the trees were swaying back and forth and sparking and smoking. And I called the utility company. Two weeks later, they come out here and they show me where the tree is singed. <laughs> and they said, that could have burned your house down because palm trees are like Roman candles when they catch on fire. So if that tree had caught on fire, our house could have burned down. Now, I'm a filmmaker who tells you to know what your policy is. I don't know that my policy would have covered power line hitting palm tree burning house down. I'm imagining it would, but I couldn't even answer that question today because who would have thought that it was even something that remotely could happen? And, and the point is, you need to understand everything that can go on around your house. If you live out in the woods, um, Malibu, which we talked about in the film, uh, Bobby Milstein is, is my podcast guest. Um, if people will be able to see him on an, an episode of my podcast. And he talks about how people live in Malibu so all that stuff can be close to their house. They want to be in the woods. Yeah. They don't want 200 feet of clear space between their house and the nearest tree. Uh, so you take your chances, but at least hedge your bet and have some type of protection if that chance doesn't, doesn't work. If you live out in the middle of the, the wilderness, do you have ways to get in and out? You know, he was telling me in Malibu, they didn't build it to be as big as it is. So there's not clear, obvious paths to evacuate where there's three or four ways out. Paradise, California, so many lives were lost because people couldn't get out. The fire jumped in the wind ahead of where they were trying to escape. People stayed till the last minute. And, and tragically, lives were lost. So you really need to understand all the dynamics about where yeah. you live. And don't yeah. be a hero and say, I'm going down with the ship. You know, that's how people die. A guy I had on who was talking about flooding in Naples during Ian, he went to his daughter's house, but his neighbor didn't, and she died in the hurricane. So you got to take this stuff seriously. Exactly. And my, uh, my nephew just bought a new home. And I uh, said, and so I'll say, I'll say, what's the evacuation route out of your neighborhood? Because they don't build transportation networks in neighborhoods with evacuations in mind. Rapid mass evacuations. They're nice. They're nice wavy streets and they're small and cul-de-sacs and one or two exits to an arterial road. But we want a tree in the neighborhood so it doesn't hear the noise, et cetera, of a major arterial road. And I said to him, I said, how do you get out? Do you know how to get out? Do you know how to make which turn you have to make if the air was so full of smoke that you can't see the street signs, et cetera? How do you get in and out of your neighborhood? And then how do you get in and out of your town? And we've seen what governments call success stories, these long lines of cars on highways. And I always counsel people that if the time to go is when they give you a voluntary evacuation, if you wait until the mandatory evacuation, it's too late. You're probably going to get smoke with the hurricane while you're in a lineup on I-95, I whatever it might be, trying to evacuate and get out. But again, similar to the insurance policy, nobody gives this piece of inf information, this education bit to people as they take over home ownership. They don't give them and say, hey, these are the things that you need to consider in the exceptionally unlikely event that xyz happens yeah and there's two other groups we can throw under the bus then if we, we're already trashing insurance companies builders and realtors neither one of those groups and i'm not saying it's their job maybe they're doing the best they can and they're doing what they're supposed to but a builder doesn't usually go over all the safety features that are in the house that that you bought and all the things that they did to make that house survive disasters probably don't even mention it they just want you to buy the house yeah. and realtors don't tell you anything and, and maybe that's because they don't have to. Why would they kill a sale by telling you, oh, by the way, this house is going to wash away if there's uh, four feet of water exactly. or if there's a fire, you're dying in here. But here, here's your uh, here's some cookies. Welcome to the neighborhood. You know, it's not going to happen. Yeah. So you can't rely on them to do it. Your interest is the only one that matters. 
You know, Chris Rock has a hilarious comedy bit that I heard uh, the other day where he tells his kids when they go out that you're not special once you leave this house. Nobody cares about you. And, you know, it's a little bit of a stretch, but the reality is that's true with your home. Nobody cares about you yeah. more than you do. You need yeah. to protect your family. So you don't rely on all these other people. There's great resources. There's a lot of great resources. There's a lot of great people you can ask questions to, but they're not coming to you with the information. No. You need to go get it. And especially, and, and then that's difficult. And I know uh, the U.S. has the same problem. We have a very competitive real estate market. So you're getting into a market where you're trying to bid for multiple homes at the time with multiple offers. And, and one of the first things that real estate agents are counseling people to do um, in some cases is withdraw your requirement for a home inspection because the seller may see that as a barrier. And I'm like, you have got, no, because that is one of your few outs on a real estate transaction, at least here under the rules in Canada, that if you put that in, you can take something out of that report and say, oh, I'm going to use that as a reason for not to go through with the transaction, you know, because then somebody can talk to you about hurricane straps. Um, and the idea that your house is built to code, I think is f fairly hilarious because I like to refer to building codes as a minimally acceptable standard. It does not mean something you should celebrate or high five yourself that you bought a house built to code because that just means it probably won't fall down around you. That's pretty much all code does. But yeah, exactly that. People are counseling in a busy environment to take away the some of the few safeguards that do exist in the transaction. Yeah, and if you look at it from a transactional point of view, if I'm selling my house and I get two offers and one says no inspection, and the other says uh, 30 days, uh, seven days to get an inspection, and the price is close with each offer, I'm taking the one that doesn't want the inspection. We're, we're exactly. not stupid as, as human beings. But my problem is, I think somebody builds a piece of garbage, and then they pass it on to the next person who passes it on to the next person, and we keep rewarding that. We keep rewarding somebody else's stupidity. Mm -hmm. So you chose to build a house of wood in Tampa, Florida, where that's the dumbest thing a human being could do. And now you're selling it to me and I'm not doing anything about it. So I'm just buying it. Yeah. I mean, I'm rewarding your, your stupidity. Yep. And, and the, the real estate market is so out of whack now that the housing prices have doubled in some instances. You know, people are trying to rent houses here for $10,000, $12,000 a month. That's <laughs> insane. Those houses aren't <laughs> worth that. Yep. And, but people, somebody will pay it somebody will come along and do it. So you've now rewarded mediocrity. And then we're surprised when there's problems later. Exactly. And we, we have many issues that, that are similar to that. And people don't, uh, don't necessarily um, think longer term, they think short beautification, nice, beautiful place to live, but they don't take um, all those considerations. So what would you think is the biggest lesson that you hope people take away from watching your film to have a solid understanding of what you're getting into and and what your risks are so if you're buying a house know what the risks are in that neighborhood and that doesn't just mean looking on the fema map and saying yeah we're in a flood zone Histor historically find out what happens in that neighborhood when it rains you know we were looking at a house when we first moved here and I asked our realtor, does it flood here? And she looked at me like, uh, I don't know. And so a guy was walking down the street and I said, so what's it like when it rains here? And he goes, you don't want to buy that house. He goes, water comes up to the front door when it rains. We got the hell out of there yeah. so quickly. You need to understand what the risks are of that property. How was that property built? What, what code was it built to? And how does code change in that neighborhood? That building code in the community you're in might be from 10 years ago, it might be from 15 years ago. As they see in Florida, every time a, an area gets wiped out, it's the older houses that tend to suffer the most damage because building codes have changed dramatically yeah. in, in terms of what people should be building and not building. So I hope people come away with a sense of awareness and a sense of responsibility that they need to really know what they're getting into. Because when you see, and that's why I showed so many people that lost everything in the film, you don't want to end up like that. These are really nice people that have several years of hell to deal with. 
because yeah. of whatever the circumstances were of the disaster. And in some cases, people never recover from it. You know, you never get back your family heirlooms and the things passed down from generations. You never get back uh, that time that you spent, that four or five years fighting with the insurance company, fighting, getting a builder, uh, adapting to the new codes. Where do you live in the interim? Um, you know, then a pandemic hit. So from the 2018 film, that caused people a lot of extra problems. So don't, don't end up like that. Do everything you can to avoid becoming a victim. Because I've never seen a victim that goes, yeah, it was worth it. That was great. I'm glad. Yeah, absolutely. Going. And and be be like the man at the end of your film. Be like the guy who owns the last house standing. Um, you know, sure, he had a bit of a technical engineering background, but uh, really, was he that much of an anomaly? Or did he just actually sit down with a cup of coffee and take a little bit of time to think? He was He's a smart guy who he and his, um, I, I believe it was his uncle, they own the house together. And they said, what can we build that can survive, not what the code is, but yeah. the worst disaster that could happen? So in Mexico Beach, you know, nothing really survives a 15-foot storm surge. They built a house to survive that. Yeah. A lot of houses that are elevated, you see pictures from Galveston and other places where it, they're actually, it looks like they're on stilts. Yeah. And the house just crumbles once water erodes underneath it. I mean, water is so powerful. But look at it, it shapes mountains. It moves things that are unbelievable what the power of water can be. So they put their house, I think, 20, 30, 25, 30 feet into the ground in, in, in concrete. And the house is built of concrete. And, and they survived houses blowing into their house and washing by and hitting their house. They had some damage, but their house survived. Not everybody can afford that. If you can't afford to do that, maybe that's not where you should be living. Maybe you live a couple miles inland. Maybe you live somewhere away from the beach and you go to the beach on weekends. But if you're going to put that house right on the water, to me, it's insane not to put a house that you know could survive the worst possible disaster. And then you, you and I discussed this when you were on uh, my podcast. They changed the building code in Mexico Beach, but they didn't change it to survive a Category 5 hurricane. So all the people rebuilding... Yeah, the house has a better chance of surviving than it did from the 1940s when it was probably built. But if a Category 5 hits again, who knows? That's not the code they're building to. Yeah, and it's it, we, the Fort McMurray, uh, Alberta fires that happened in 2016, um, they came up with a new fire smart standard for housing. But it was applying to the new builds, not the insurance funded rebuilds. So the houses that burned down were rebuilt in the exact same place in the exact same fashion. But if you wanted to build a new house in the lot next door, you then had to uh, apply, you know, comply with the fire smart uh, code guidelines. And they did that because the insurance companies were balking at the additional cost, which is not different from the gentleman in your film that highlighted the choice between a granite or not granite countertop in the new house. And it was along that lines of maybe $5,000 on a brand new home. And the insurance companies persuaded the policymakers to not make that a mandatory as part of the rebuild. Yeah. People will turn that stuff down. Imagine if you could go into a car dealer and they say, this car is $45,000, but if you don't get the airbags or the, the five-star crash rating, you can get it for 35. There's people that would take the $35,000. Exactly. And roll the and, dice. Yes. Yeah. So there has, there's now federal regulation that you can't do that. And that's what we really need for houses, but it's not going to happen because we can't agree in this country on whether the sky is blue or light blue, or, you know, is it cloudy? Is it sunny? People are going to fight over it and lobbyists will find a way to keep real change from happening. So it, it's not going to happen. And that's unfortunate because I'll, I'll give you a great example. Hurricane Ian, I had a gentleman on my podcast who I met whose house was flooded in Naples. His whole neighborhood, 20 houses in this community, all were flooded. Now they, everybody's rebuilt, but they rebuilt exactly what was there before. Yeah. So if there's another flood, I said, did you do anything different if another flood should hit? They go, no, we, 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 the community is not going to, everybody's not going to elevate their house. So all they did was put the same thing back there and it's going to happen again if they get hit by a hurricane. And it's like, that to, that's crazy to me that, that insurance companies allow it. 
and and a lot of them aren't, which is unfortunate. It's very hard to get insurance. I know people that have their insurance has doubled or tripled in that particular community. Their homeowner's insurance went up five thousand dollars per house, so a hundred thousand dollars the policy went up. But that doesn't seem like enough if you think about it to to rebuild yeah. twenty houses. So what could they have done? Maybe there's some kind of system they could have put in that blocks off the community. You know, we have a um, a, a company that was in the in my last film, floodproofing.com. Um, these guys put up these huge barriers around houses that can stop flooding. I would think that coastal areas and communities would all be looking at stuff like that. Yeah, it's like why why aren't we doing that? It has to be less expensive than the damage that occurs every time there's a disaster. It's like the the cost of being proactive is always much lower than the cost of being reactive. But it's the competing uh, budgetary requirements when you're competing against money for healthcare, money for program X, Y, Z, let's mitigate against something that we don't know when or if it will occur. And if I'm a short-term politician and trying to get reelected in the next three years, uh, I'm not worried about mitigating against a disaster that probably won't occur for another dozen years, maybe. I'm worried about the uh, programs, et cetera, that, that bring forward. And that uh, reminds me of a quote that I got here from uh, that former head of FEMA, that was in your uh, that was in your film when he said, you know, I just, you know, if people don't build back better and if they choose not to do that, why is the government continually on the hook uh, for the cost of replacing that next time? And I wrote a couple of blogs this week on that saying, you know, it is unsustainable to expect that the federal government in any country is going to continuously show up as the insurer of last resort. I mean, with the cost of rebuilding going up and up, there will be a point where whether it's FEMA in the U.S. or Public Safety Canada here in Canada will just they just won't have the money to bail out homeowners who choose to build back exactly the same. Yeah, Brock Long was the gentleman you're talking about. Yeah. He was great, the former FEMA director who um, just said it. That That's the truth. It's like, yeah. why does but that's who everybody expects to bail them out. But I think homeowners all think such short term, it's not going to happen to me. And, you know, who knows where I'll be five years from now. Yet I wonder who are all these people buying solar panels? Isn't, <laughs> isn't that a 30 year investment? They tell you, hey, it's only going to cost you 50 grand, but we'll spread yeah. that out over 30 years. I said, 30 years. I don't know if I'm going to live for 30 more years. Tell me where I'm going to make my money back and what's it worth if I sell it. So they couldn't answer that question. So I don't have, I have solar panels, but I, I think we all do, we need to all think long term, at least in terms of our family and our lives in that house, it doesn't mean you're going to be there 50 years. But if in two years, something happens, you want to be protected, you want to be able to get your life back. And and you can't rely on the government bailing you out. You know, that's when you see the disaster, you know, FEMA is probably one of the most maligned organizations that you hear because Imagine rolling into town, and I'm not necessarily defending or, 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 or praising them, but you roll into town after a disaster. Nobody's happy. Everybody's miserable. Yeah. And you're the person that they're yelling at to get stuff done. So it's a thankless job. And when you look at the magnitude of some of these things, it's just you, you don't want to be in that position if you can avoid having to stand in that line to, to wait for somebody to come give you, give you a hand to help you. Yeah, and it, exactly. And, and when you have not taken any of these measures to take the responsibility on your own, you're in line with how many other people waiting for an insurance agent. You hear companies dispatched insurance agents to the claim. Well, if everybody's affected, uh, the insurance agents are are sourced the same as every other. Your fire department is, is staffed to deal with the periodic fire, maybe a little bit of surge capacity, but at a certain rate that they expect. They're not funded to respond to significant major disruptions, and neither is the insurance agent. They don't have 100 extra agents sitting around with nothing to do waiting for a disaster to happen to run down and collect and process claims. I mean, like you said, I think the average time frame is about two years on the optimistic side to be made whole again after a disaster. And a lot of people are not prepared for that two years of misery. And it's when you get in line matters. You yeah. know, it's like when your flight is canceled, you can go have a drink in the bar. You better be the first one running up to the line to try to catch the next flight. When your house is damaged, 
when you turn that application in absolutely matters. So you can't dilly dally on that and say, well, we'll get to it eventually. Um, you know, we'll stay out here at the Best Western for a week and then we'll go home and we'll deal with the mess. You need to jump on it and try to figure things out as quickly as possible because that absolutely makes a difference. And, you know, and something else that I just thought of, and this relates to fires with the, the podcast guest I just had, he was talking about Topanga Canyon in Malibu, where he goes, the water pressure is unbelievable here in, in terms of what it is for each individual. But all of a sudden there's a fire. Everybody turns on their sprinklers. Everybody's tapping into the water. Everybody's trying to get water on their house. They don't plan for that. No. So you think that's your defense is you're going to stay there and fight the fire. You may be getting a little drizzle coming out of that spigot because everybody has the water on. And it's the same thing in a disaster. Everybody needs help at that point. So if you're not there raising your hand and doing what you can to get help quickly, you're going to get lost in the shuffle. And that, that makes it even worse for you. And uh, that's why I leverage technology. I have all of that on my smartphone. I have my app for my insurance company and I can fire, file a house claim from my phone. I don't need to get a hold of anybody. I can open the claim, file it, and at least start the process. Unless uh, you live in um, Panama City and had Hurricane Michael and then had Verizon as your carrier and they went down <laughs> and they were down for weeks. Yeah. So even oh. the technology can fail yeah. you if there's no infrastructure to get you power, to get you yep. those cell towers are damaged. All of a sudden, all that stuff that's great because you have it on your phone, your phone's not working. Yeah, I mean, we, we the uh, for expediency and a bunch of other reasons here in Ottawa, the paramedic service uses the cell towers to bounce their signal off of, except when we had a tornado come through here in 2018 and took out a section of the city, it took out the cell tower. So not only could people not call 911, the paramedics could not use their radio system in vicinity of the damaged area with people who were injured, et cetera. They couldn't talk to each other at all because the cell tower came down. And that's your absolutely a downfall of dependency on technology is if that's your backup plan and you're hoping that, you know, the hurricane took out everything, but please leave the cell phone towers alone so that I can, uh, so that I can figure out who to chat to. I mean, that is, that is, um, that is a real issue. One question I did want to ask you is, uh, did you run in, into any, major roadblocks when producing the film other than the standard of trying to find people and you know ver venturing into the m most disrupted times in people's lives did you run into any systemic barriers to you putting this film together you know one of the toughest ones was fema because it's very difficult to get in there as a filmmaker to do an interview and you can understand why i mean yeah. most people are doing a film because they want to bash them and talk about in inefficiencies and, and so when we were sitting there at the film, the day we were interviewing Brock Long, the PR person came down before Brock got there and said, how the hell did you get in here? You know, who, who let you in? Yeah. And I said, well, the reason we're here, and it took like six or six to nine months for us to get into FEMA. I said, they understood the pitch that we made that we weren't talking about anything that they've done to judge what they do. It's how can we be more proactive to avoid disasters? Yeah. And that was the tone of the interview. And they still were uh, paranoid about that. So I had to show them the film before they had, in a sense, final cut yeah. where they could look at it and say, nah, we don't like what you said. And, and as a filmmaker, you never want to do that because you could have some powerful things. It, the only reason I agreed to that is I knew there was nothing about that they could disagree yeah. with. If anything, it's an asset for them. The only thing I had to worry about was Brock left before the film came out. And I was going, oh, crap, what if he left under bad terms and they don't want us to use it because Brock is on there. But they had no, you know, that, I guess all that went well. And, and FEMA is very positive about the film. They were a great, um, a great asset rather than any, any, any kind of liability. But that did make me nervous. And the other was getting Hank Ovink, uh, the water ambassador from the Netherlands, because he's such a busy guy that... Yeah. You know, they said, well, he's going to be in um, in St. Petersburg, Florida, and we can probably get you at five o'clock in the afternoon. And I said, but he's a busy guy. Five o'clock is never going to happen, is it? We're going to be set. I need this guy in yep. the film. And we're never going to get him. So I got him at seven in the morning. And Hank was gracious enough to show up and do that interview. And I, that guy's a superstar. He's yep. so knowledgeable and, and was so great. 
And since then, I've stayed in contact with him, and he just has so much information and, and is so helpful. Um, in terms of other stuff, we weren't really trying to expose flaws in the system. We're trying to make people more aware. So we weren't you know, confronting insurance companies. We weren't confronting builders. Uh, builders would be an obvious place you want to confront, but we weren't, we, that wasn't what this film's about. Yeah. My next film is going to deal with that. And so now I can deal with that hurdle. <laughs> exactly. But and I, and I think it, it, it attacks the problem from a positive perspective in that this is all about how can we set people up for success the next time around? How can we set people up instead of going through the, the swath of the disaster and saying, these are all the things that went wrong. These are all the people that failed and pointing fingers which is very, you know, easy for people to do. It's more setting it up in a in a case of saying, this is use these as an example of how you can best prepare yourself. Because as a viewer, if I watch the film, um, I I went back and reread all my insurance policies. I went back and and sent a couple, and for the first time in I don't know how many years, I actually got my insurance agent on the phone and talked about the house policy. What does this mean? I mean, what do you consider a force majeure? You and I having a different definition of what that is in the insurance policy. So, you know, do I need to consider an additional rider? And he said, you know, the, for me, the earthquake insurance was so much more expensive because nobody buys it and it's a pooled asset. It's a pooled coverage. So, so few people do buy it in an earthquake zone because again, in 70 years, nobody has lost a house structure to earthquake damage here. We've lost it a few. Takes one. Well, I, I've been in a, in this industry enough to know that exactly that. So when I renew my house insurance, uh, there will be an earthquake rider on it. I'm I'm not going to risk a half a million dollar plus asset because I don't want to spend five hundred uh, dollars on on a policy. And then after the fact, of course, I will be eating crow if that was to happen. Absolutely, and you know, earthquakes are such a scary thing. You know, growing up in California. Um, I was in a lot of them and you're, you're really helpless with a hurricane. You see it coming. Yeah. It can turn, but it's not a surprise. Yeah. Earthquake. You're just lying there. You're driving somewhere. You're sitting at some place and it could all just come crashing down on you. And California, I mean, our expert in the film, um, talking about the buildings in San Francisco and Los Angeles, he said like 60% of the buildings would be uninhabitable because they're not built they're built so you don't die in them, yeah. but that doesn't mean you can't go home at the end of the day. Yeah. You can't. You can't live in that anymore. So that's frightening what that would do to California, and they're just they're, – they're ripe for that. Yeah, and it, 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 that was such an important point um, because just showing how the Japanese have houses that move on rollers, I'm not sure that persuading – uh, Americans or Canadians to set to that standard, but to just them to get them to understand that the building code for earthquakes is designed so that the building doesn't kill you yeah. and you can survive in it. You can't use it tomorrow. You don't have a house to live in anymore, but you'll be able to walk out what's left of the front door and, and be okay. And that's fine until you live in a city of where I live is a million people. There isn't another city within a two hour drive that could host even a fraction of the people looking for alternate accommodation. If we were to have a significant earthquake here, there's no place for anybody to go. There's no alternative housing. I mean, our rental market is point not something percent vacancy rate. There's next to no vacant accommodations. So if you put 10,000 families onto the economy, th th there's there's no place for them to rent. Where where does everybody go? So I think that's a huge um, a huge issue we all face. But uh, tell us about your next project that's coming up. Well, we're working. I'm working with a gentleman, and we're making a film. Um, it's called Built to Last: Buyer Beware. And the you know we're in the process of trying to raise money for the film, but the idea is. Do we really understand at all what we're in, how it was built, what went into building it, and, and what our risks are? And the answer is, I guarantee you, most people have no idea. You know, you see a, a cool house and you go, is it near a school? Does it have a swimming pool in the backyard? Is there a playroom upstairs for my kids? Uh, all the things that make your life better on a day-to-day -day basis, but they don't make you safe. They don't give you any kind of security. And we want to explore that 
and talk about it's it's a similar theme to the last house standing in that you need to be on top of your game but we're going to show you how not on top of your game most people are and and why you need to change that thinking because it, it, it's just tragic you know you, you talk about uh, uh earthquakes there and how you would uh, how people would go on with their lives here in tampa they estimate that you know a million people would be injured if we if hurricane ian had hit here that 60 percent of the businesses would have been destroyed the amount of people that would have been homeless would have been staggering and only by the luck of the hurricane turning did we not get a bullseye from that storm so yeah when you think big picture for anything then it really matters how your house is built if it's not built to last um, you're going to have some problems because if there's a million other people that are displaced, that that's awful. Where where are you going to go? Yeah, where 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 are you going to live? And um, a lot of that, I mean, you would think communities would learn from the lessons that came out of Katrina, when uh, you know a lot of the reasons people did not return post Katrina was the fact that the schools weren't were gone, and that the businesses were gone. I'm I'm not going to rush back and rebuild my home when the critical infrastructure and the social infrastructure is not there and the public entities are are doing such a disastrous job to use a pun of putting those back in place because it's not just you know the homeowner is the key element it's where you where you live but a prime example of um, actually in uh, in hurricane michael my brother-in-law lived in uh, just outside of panama city he was on an exchange officer at Tyndall Air Force Base. He was a member of the Canadian Air Force. And he was down there and they wrote it out in their rental beachfront accommodation, um, which had a whole bunch of pieces missing and ended up uh, just leaving because the place was such a disaster area. And he just he just packed the family up and went back to Canada because there was there was really no hope of trying to rebuild there as a renter. It's kind of disturbing that Tyndall was so unprotected, considering uh, the importance of it. It's kind of like MacDill Air Force Base here in Tampa. You know, they evacuated that for Ian and got everything out. You like to think that the place they, they thought the most of about, we yeah. need this to be safe. So that's pretty frightening. And, you know, and, and people don't think about that. When that hotel gets destroyed, all the people that worked there, it's not just the yeah. people that would come stay there. It's the people that worked in the kitchen, the people that worked on the beach staff, the desk people. And they may live a few miles from there, five or 10 miles, their houses might have been destroyed. So now they have no place to live, no job to go to, to have money to rebuild what they lost. So it's a cycle that's just hard to get out of with all the things that are damaged. They're experiencing that right now in Sanibel Island um, from Hurricane Ian. You know, they relied on tourism. Some restaurants are opening up, some businesses are slowly opening up, but there's not the people staying there like they were because a lot of those places were destroyed. So the whole economy depends on each piece working properly. You eliminate a few of them, and the domino effect of that can be significant. And and, and that is so true across any – and like you said, it doesn't matter, and you showed it in the film, whether it's a wildfire, whether it's a flood, whether it's a hurricane, that um, there are so many calamities. And just understanding where you live and the hazards to which you're exposed – by what living like you're exposed to a hurricane living in Tampa. Now you have lots of options as to where you live and the flooding that may come from that. Um, but if you live in Tampa or if you live in coastal Florida, welcome to hurricane. You, you have to be prepared for a hurricane, which some of us, uh, I grew up in the East coast of Atlanta, Canada. So we're in a hurricane zone, but far less frequent strikes than the Southern U S and you would think every time a hurricane happened that it was it had never happened before because there's mass panic in the stores. They've announced actually your uh, your governor announced right now. I think you're undergoing a sales tax hiatus on hurricane preparedness supplies. Why why is this a thing every year when when Florida is in the bullseye every year? Well. I, I think they have that at the wrong time of the year. The time they should be doing this is December, January, February, when people can actually fix some things that might matter yeah. and save their lives, whether I can go get water and batteries. Um, yeah, sure, that's an emergency need. But, man, you see it here when there's a disaster, the long lines, people lining up to get gas, people doing this. It's like if I see a storm two days away, 
first of all, I have I have an electric car, so I'm I'm not really going to worry about the gas. But <laughs> we have to worry about it with my wife's car. Don't wait till the last minute. There's no panic in the beginning. Go do those things when it's not a panic. It's very hard to do things when you're panicking. Your brain freezes up. You know, I used to have to as a weatherman. I used to have to go outside in the cold to tell you not to go outside in the cold. So I'd have to yeah. be out there for eight or nine hours. My brain would freeze, you know, icicles on your face. You haven't gone to the bathroom in three hours and you're just miserable. And it's hard to think under those circumstances. So the time to plan and the time to think is way before the storm happens. You know, one of the great quotes from the film, uh, nobody wakes up the day of a fire and makes their plan. Yeah. You needed to do it a long time ago. And the other quote that I love is probably my favorite one in the film is hope is not a strategy. Yep. You know, people hope it's not going to happen to them. Okay. Is that your strategy? It's not <laughs> exactly. going to happen to me. Yeah. I'm going to, my house is going to dodge a hurricane. We'll be fine. Good plan. Go hey, with that. Exactly. So um, before we end this, just uh, I want to give you a chance to uh, where can people go? Uh, where would you point them to, uh, to, find out where to rent your uh, film. Well, the best place for the filmmaker is if you go to my website and do it, because then we get some little, little change from that. It's uh, thelasthousestanding.org, thelasthousestanding.org. And it's on there. You can rent it for $3.99. But I, I say this because I truly believe it in my heart, or I would never have made this film. I want you to see it one way or the other. So on 2B TV, it's available for free. You do have to sit through some commercials. <laughs> I think every six months they send me 20 cents. It's not the point. You get to see it. Yeah. If you search the PBS station in your neighborhood, in your community, it might have been on there. So it could be on their website for free. You might be able to find it on other sources. So just Google it. I think it's important that you watch the film and understand you need to be your own best advocate. So I would encourage everybody to do that. And I also have a, a podcast. It's a Tell Us How to Make It Better. Tell us how to make it better.com. And you go there and you can see a lot of the topics that we're talking about here. You were a guest on my podcast. You're one of my best guests. And uh, there's so many important topics that we talk about. It's warning signs and solutions for homeowners. What do we need to do to protect ourselves? And I talk about that every week. So tell us how to make it better.com and the last house standing.org. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for taking the time, George. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on, Jeff. I appreciate it. Fantastic conversation with George. Please take the time to visit his website, thelasthousestanding.org, and take the time to review everything that's in this podcast interview. It's fantastic information. It's what you need to know. If you're a homeowner or if you're an individual who's considering being a homeowner in the future. So thank you very much for everybody taking the time to watch this first ever YouTube live video of a podcast interview many more to come drop over at jeff at preparednesslabs.ca uh, drop me a line tell me what you think and drop over to triple w inside my canoehead.ca sign up for our newsletter follow our links thank you very much and have yourself an incredible day <laughs>